in this episode, known and forgotten history of the Great Opposition. Over the centuries, the Jangarian Khanate terrified a large part of the Eurasian continent. A powerful army, ambitious plans for conquest, and a bloodthirsty temper painted the image of a powerful and merciless enemy. A cruel hammer of the Jungar military campaign passed through the Kazakh lands. In the epic, it remained as years of the great disaster, a real cry of the wounded Kazakh people who survived the fiercest battles with the Jungars in the period from 1723 to 1727. But the history of relations between the Kazakhs and the Jungars has a much longer term and is written not only in blood. How Jungars threatened the Eurasian continent. It was a powerful militarized state. Toponymy is a witness of history. For example, Balkash. In fact, we call it Jungarian Way. It is Mongolian name, Balkash. Jungars and Kazakhs relations outside politics. There was such a saying among the Kazakhs, if you want your child to be beautiful, take the Uzbek woman as your wife. If you want your child to be a botter, take a comic wife. What happened on the expanses of the Kazakh steppes in the 17th, 18th centuries? How did the Kazakhs live and fight with the Jungars? Were those two nations such unequivocal enemies? Unknown details of the Jungar invasion in this episode. There are many historical documents and legends about the relations of the Kazakhs and the Jungars, but as a rule, they boil down to military confrontations and battles. However, there must be many other mysteries and secrets in the history of these two nations. My name is Andrei Slozin. It is The Time Puzzle. The Jungarian Khanate finally formed in the 17th century on the basis of the disintegrated Oirat state of Tatar, which in turn was born after the collapse of the Mongolian Empire. The new Khanate included tribes of Koros, Darbets, and Koits. The name Oirat, or Oir in Mongolian, and Oirat means ally, union, or close. In the beginning, it was such a huge state that it included the lands of modern Kazakhstan, parts of Russia, China, Mongolia, and Kyrgyzstan. There is a lot of evidence of that period, which are well studied by historians. A local historian who has studied this topic for many years, Gomira Bilyalova, told us the following. The middle of the 17th century, the Jungarian Khanate appeared in the vast steppes. It was a powerful militarized state. It was armed with military guns. They even had weapons, factories. And by the beginning of the 18th century, not only the Jetsu, but also the main territory of central Kazakhstan was dominated by the Jungars. Such military power was possible only thanks to the strict rules that were established in the Jungarian society. So the Jungars had a certain number of laws, which is known to modern researchers under the name Step Code. According to this law, leaving the battlefield was punishable by death or a huge fine. Non-warning about the appearance of the enemy or betrayal were also a death warrant. A special role in the Jungar state was given to the restoration of casualties of manpower. According to the same law, every year 40 wealthy families were supposed to ensure the marriage of at least four bachelors from another tribe and help them pay money for the brides. The army also was restored by slaves. Of course, they were put on the front line of the battle. However, according to the same step code, for the unjustified murder of a slave, there was a high fine, up to 45 cattle. Jungarian warriors were considered incredibly strong, resilient, and disciplined. Surprisingly, these qualities were appreciated not only by their leaders. Jungarian warriors were distinguished by courage and good preparedness. 
They were wonderful warriors and did not yield to other nations, including the Kazakhs and Chinese in the art of fighting. And the Kazakhs had many Jungar warriors, those who were captured. They became slaves or became Tulunguts. Tolinguts are the military guards of the Kazakh Khans, and the main part of the Tolinguts consisted of the Jungarian warriors who were captured by the Kazakhs. In the history, there are many examples of use of prisoners in the battle against their own. One of the clearest examples are the specialized troops of the Ottoman Empire. The Janissaries. The Kazakhs also had similar military units, which were called Tolenguts. Historian and writer Radek Timur Galiev told us all about it. There was such a phenomenon, Tolenguts. These were the personal guards of the Kazakh Khans and Sultans. 90% of them were of Jungar and Kalmyk origin. Generally, it is clear why this was happening. Again, this is not a purely Kazakh phenomenon. We know the role played by the Janissaries in Turkey. Janissaries are captives who were taken by children, cultivated, and on the blades of which the Turkish sultans relied. Similarly, it was happening in Kazakhstan. The practice of taking children from the subjugated peoples were for the service of the Sultan was introduced by the Turkish Sultan Murad in 1365. These were the children of conquered people such as Georgians, Albanians, Armenians, Bosnians and Serbs. Janissaries were considered the property of the Sultan. For a long time they were forbidden to marry, have children or any property. They lived in special barracks, separately from the main army. A similar situation was with the military units of the Kazakh army assembled from the Jungarian soldiers. Kazakhs very often were guided by their tribal interests and tribal patriotism. And therefore, in order to provide themselves with sufficiently reliable protection in this environment, the Kazakhs acquired guards of the Tolinguts. With individual Khans, they could reach up to several thousand. Ablai Khan had quite a lot of them, and they could be said to be the backbone, the core of his troops, on which he relied. It is not known for certain whether the special capture of Jungarian children by the Kazakhs was practiced in order to create subdivisions of Tolinguts. Historians have not found evidence of this. However, in the epos of the Kazakh people, there is a story telling about the Battle of Two Batars, one of which, according to the legend, was a Jungar, but grew up among the Kazakhs, and subsequently was defeated by Nauris by Batar. This legend was told to us by a member of the Union of Journalists of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Ahlima Kosemova. Nauris by Batar early began to take part in the battles, proved himself as a good warrior. We really got to know about him during the Battle of Anurakai. When the Jungars attacked, Nauris Bai was only 23 years old. The Kalmy commander began to challenge his opponents one by one. Only the young Nauris Bai decided to risk. He rode forward on his horse, fought and defeated the enemy, Kaskelen. That was the name of the defeated enemy. Although Nauris Bai was young for such an important battle, he already knew how to fight. He was a fairly experienced warrior. Having caught a convenient moment, Nauris Bai plunged his sword into the enemy's stomach, spun it a couple of times, and gutted him like a ram. People of both sides were shocked, especially ours, who were worried about a young guy. They breathed freely. After this fight, the people learned about Nauris Bai. His name has become widely known. According to one version of historians, Kaskilen was raised by the Kazakhs from an early age. 
But as soon as the Jungar troops reached the Owl, where Kaskalan grew, he went over to their side. There is a description in the folklore of how the Kazakhs reacted to Kaskalen, who went to battle against Naris by Bater. They met him with angry cries and curses. But how did it happen that a settlement near Almaty was later named after the Jungar Bater Kaskalen? It is quite possible that the Jungars, who were held captive by the Kazakhs, did not tell their real names, but simply took pseudonyms in honor of the places where the stakes were located. Perhaps they thought that in this way they would protect their family and clan from shame. However, there is another version that was told to us by the candidate of historical sciences, a leading researcher at the Institute of History and Ethnology, named after Chokang Valikhanov, Awaz Han Shashayev. <laughs> There is such information in oral history, but we must look deeper and turn to earlier sources. In general, since the times of the Saks and Huns, our ancestors did not name any settlements with the names of people. Lakes and rivers were called, respectively, the geographical features of the area. For example, Borgon, Su, Kalsai, Bakash, how did the names of these lakes come about? Their names described these lakes. They gave a characteristic. So they didn't use people's names as the toponyms. The ancient Turks did the same, calling and at the same time describing a specific area. There's a lot of controversy about how the name Kaskalen appeared. Some say it is the name of a river, but it is not. Kaskalen is the name of the Jungarian ruler. Also, the above-mentioned Zai, San Kege, and Narinkol, these are all the names of the Jungars. They were given to settlements for the purpose of trying to erase the historical memory of the Kazakhs and strengthen the influence of the Jungars on our land, as if reminding us that they are our masters, that now this land belongs to them. For over a hundred years, they ruled in this territory and pursued such cutting policy. Indeed, not only the city of Kaskalen entered the list of settlements and geographical objects of Kazakhstan called by Jungarian names. Not everyone knows that Shamalgan, Talgar, Ablaikut, Bayan Aul, and many other names belong to the Oirat language. The famous Balkash Lake is also on this list. Now, the version is often voiced that Balkash is a Kazakh word that translates as bumps in a swamp. But there is an ancient legend in which there is not a word about a swamp and hillocks. But it is said about the origin of a large blue lake. According to one ancient legend, Khan Balkash lived in the midst of the boundless steppes and he had a daughter, Ili, who fell in love with a poor man named Karatal. But the Han opposed and turned the young people into rivers, and so that they would not be reunited deep, and Blue Lake Balkash lay down between them. In fact, we call it by the Jungara name, the Mongolian name Balkash. The Turkic people always called him Koktenis or Kokshetanis, the Blue Sea. This is recorded in the sources of the 15th, 16th centuries. And then after the Jungar period, we adopted it. Well, it actually happens, really. We know that in the same Russia, in the Caucasus, there are many Turkic toponyms. Now, there are no Turks there, but the Turkic toponyms are preserved. Coming up next, how and why did the Jungar seize Kazakh lands? In the world of nomads, rich pasture lands have always been a welcome trophy, but the Kazakh land attracted the Jungarian invaders not only by that. The Jungars aimed not only to seize fertile lands, valleys full of water, rivers, but also transit routes, trade routes connecting the Oirat nomads with eastern Turkestan. You know that caravan routes were the most important at the time. They supported the very existence of the state. Of course, Jetusu was the most attractive for the Jungar. 
excellent climate, green pastures, and developed commercial and urban infrastructure, Taraz, Turkestan, Sairam, and many other ancient cities were centers not only of crafts and trade, but also spiritual strongholds of that period. Now it is known for certain that in these cities, Buddhists, Muslims, and Christians peacefully got along. The inhabitants of the ancient cities engaged in trade, engaged in science, art, the production of dishes, jewelry, weapons, and clothing. It housed the largest markets of Central Asia. Nomads need to interact with the sedentary population, with farmers, and for this support, some kind of territory is needed. People there have to be engaged in handicraft work and farming. For the Kazakhs, such an economic core was the shores of the Sirdarya, where Shimkent, Turkestan, Signak, Sauron, and other cities were. At the end of the 17th century, there were up to 32 cities. This was the economic basis of the Kazakhamate. Dominion over these regions enabled the Jungars to collect taxes, increase livestock numbers, and thus increase their military power to wage war with China and the Russian Empire. They tried to do the same on their territory initially. The founder of the Jungaran Khanate, Batur Kong Taiji, he built some towns, he tried to do something similar, but then he realized he first needed the cities of eastern Turkestan. And so he seized, first of all, the cities of eastern Turkestan and the Jungarian Khanate was based on them. But in order to build such a big empire about which the Jungarian's rulers dreamed, they needed other regions, ancient regions, where agriculture developed, where all the caravan routes passed, those that were on the territory of Kazakhstan. First of all, it is Jetsu and Sirdarya shores. Here are the two main regions that were of interest to the Jungars. In addition, control over this territory gave the Jungars unimpeded passage to the Ural and Volga rivers, where their tribesmen lived. By many historians, another reason for the Jungarian conquest was the slave trade. According to researchers, the lion's share of income in the Jungar treasury was brought by the sale of captives in slave markets. During the Tursun Khan, in the times of the Yasim Khan, there were quite serious conflicts. This is the beginning of the 17th century. Then we know that in the middle of the 17th century, there was the famous Orbulak battle, when for a few days a handful of Kazakhs used firearms to hold back a huge Jungarian army until reinforcements arrived. At the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th centuries, fortune smiled upon the Jungars. They repeatedly captured Kazakh cities on the territory of the Sirdarya. For a long time, they controlled the territory of Semirechia, the territory of Sariarka. They significantly pressed the Kazakhs in this period. Then there was a raid, which remained in history as the years of great disaster. Many researchers cite figures that in the period from 1723 to 1727, 200,000 Kazakhs were captured. About a million were killed. However, according to the further historical development of this confrontation, a question arises. How, being literally exhausted, the Kazakh army, after a short time, was able to give a fitting rebuff to the Jungars? According to Kazakh folklore, to legends, the epoch of Aktaban Shuburindi is usually distinguished. It is 1723, spring of 1723. Jungars attacked the Kazakhs. This was an early spring. This was the time when the Kazakhs were in the weakest state. The cattle was emancipated, they had no products yet, they couldn't really resist, they were all scattered in winter sides, it was very difficult for them to gather. And so the enemies of the Kazakhs, the opponents of the Kazakhs, knew this very well and they were just trying to make an attack at that time. In 1723, one of the most memorable attacks took place. But here I would like to make a reservation that this attack affected most of the Middle Jews. We often say that the entire Kazakh people suffered, half of the Kazakh people were killed. This, to put it mildly, is not true because we do not have such data. 
Moreover, in the autumn of the same year, the Kazakhs who had come to their senses under the leadership of Khan Abu Khair made a campaign against the comics, which was rather successful. They besieged the Yaik town. That is, we do not see such direct catastrophic consequences. But why did the Jungars choose this period for attack? According to historical data, the Chinese emperor Chai Si died in 1722, and the Jungars concluded a peace treaty with China, and other borders from the east were relatively safe. The Jungar sent ambassadors to the Kalmy Khan Awike with a proposal to unite and attack the Kazakhs. By 1723, the Jungar Khan Sevan Rabdan directed all his forces against the Kazakhs. The first attack of the invaders was taken by the Kazakhs of Semirechye and Irtish. In folk tales, there are many ballads about how the Kazakhs courageously and selflessly fought back the Jungars. The men fought to the death in order to enable their families to move further from the battle. For such desperate resistance, the Jungars burned owls and destroyed cities. What was their fundamental difference? If we study military conflicts, the Kazakhs had separate, quite impressive victories, but the general course of military confrontation, it was still more to the good of the Jungars. Why did this happen? Because the Jungar had such a tough, very centralized state. In the 18th century, Kazakhane generally weakened. There were a lot of civil strife between the Kazakhs. All this was solved very difficult. The Khans did not have full power, and so precisely in the military confrontation, all this, of course, was in favor for the Jungars. Restraining the onslaught of the Jungars, the residents of Tashkent kept the defense of the city for a month. Turkestan and Sairam also fiercely resisted. But soon, they too were captured. As a result of hostilities, almost the entire territory of Kazakhstan was occupied. However, in spite of such military strength and power, the Jungars were regularly defeated. History knows the names of great Batars who opposed the enemy army. Rheinbeck Batar, Naris Bai Batar, Karasai Batar and many others literally from an early age fought for the independence of their people. In the folk tales, these heroes still have special respect. The war cry of the Shapurashti tribe was Karasai. A sign was Aitumar. The fact that Shapurashti people honored Karasai Batar and wore the Aitumar sign was written by Chukan Valikhanov in his writings. After the defeat of Kaskalin from Nauris by some time passed as the Jungars continued the invasion of the Kazakh lands. And then the young Batar had to fight with Shamal Khan, also a military leader of the Jungars. There was such a custom, only the Batars equal to him in rank ran against the commanders. Narizbai headed the Kazakh army. Therefore, he was obliged to fight with Shamal Khan. Narizbai held a sword in one hand and Shokbar in the other, and they rode two opponents at each other. Narizbai was the first to strike Shamal Khan with a club. He fell off his horse and died. After this fight, Narizbai deserved the love and recognition of all the people, and he was named head of the 10,000th army. Coming up next, war and peace are two sides of one coin. Studying the national epic, one can decide that for almost two centuries the Kazakh steppe was embraced by the fire of the war with the Jungars, which did not subside for a moment. But if you study historical facts in more depth and detail, you could find another reality that will amaze you. Mothers of many of our historical characters were Kalmyks. Accordingly, bilingualism was common. We know that Ablai Khan owned the Jungarian language, the Oirat language. 
and he was not only one. Knowledge of the language was very widespread, and this is all, of course, thanks to the mothers, thanks to the wives, who were most often the younger wives. But in any case, I think they played their part. They influenced some decisions, including political decisions. It is known for certain that peoples traded with each other. Kazakhs bought bread and camels from the Jungars, who in turn bought furs. Linguists notice a lot in common between the languages of two nomadic civilizations. Also, the arrangement of the two societies and their laws were similar. Historians notice a great similarity between the Kazakh code of laws, Jeti Jargi, and the Jungarian Ihtaz. In fact, I must say that when we talk about three or two hundred years of the eternal confrontation between the Kazakhs and the Jungars, it would be stretching a point because this was not always true. Two peoples coexisted and interacted in every way. It was not such a war aimed at extermination. That is, these were conflicts that, for the most part, had some clear political goals, and very often between these wars there were periods of peace. They traded, they had diplomatic relations. Kazakh Khans, Sultans stayed at the sites of the Jungar rulers. In turn, they received the Jungar envoys. Various marriages were contracted. And quite often in those days, in the Kazakh families, one of the wives was an Oirat. During periods of peaceful life, the steppe inhabitants went to woo to the Jungars and even paid a fee for the girls they liked. Since the 18th century, relations were not only wars, they also communicated at the household level. The way of life was very similar since both nations were nomadic. Kazakhs and Kalmyks got married too often. Dynastic marriages were widespread. It was believed that the Kalmyk girls were very beautiful. Such relations were necessary in order not to fight with each other, to live in peace and harmony. There are many such examples. In fact, there were a lot of marriages, but it is necessary to note probably one peculiarity. The Kazakhs did not give up their women too eagerly. It was necessary to force very seriously that the Kazakhs would give their women to marry the Jungars because Islam did not allow, did not approve such marriages. But there were a lot of Jungars and Kalmyk women among Kazakhs. Every self-respected Batyr or B sought to marry a Kalmyk or a Jungar woman. Generally, the Kazakhs' belief was that such marriages provide very strong, healthy children. There was such a saying among the Kazakhs, if you want your child to be beautiful, take the Uzbek woman as your wife. If you want your child to be a butter, take a comic wife. Even during the military clashes, the people somehow tried to minimize their losses, understanding that everyone wants peace, everyone wants a calm and a happy life. However, political games led to quarrels between neighbors. The bees have always tried to resolve any conflicts by negotiation. For example, Tola Bee was very wise. There are many legends about him. When the invasion of the Jungars began, Tola Bee did not run away from the enemy. He was left alone in the steppe. When the Jungars arrived, the Hong Taiji asked, why you did not leave? Tola Bi replied, I cannot disassemble my yurt. There is the swallow's nest. It is impossible to disturb the nest of the swallow. 
This legend is known not only to us, but the Chungars confirmed this fact. In the relations of the two peoples, there were also everyday issues. Amir Sana sought asylum from Abulai. Abulai himself was also captured by the Jungars, but the enemies did not kill him because they respected him for his valor and courage. This all shows that the Kazakhs and the Jungars did not always strive to fight, they wanted to preserve peace. Of course, there weren't such permanent military confrontations. It is known that the Jungars, since they had been wandering here for hundreds of years, had already mastered these lands. They were also engaged in peaceful affairs. Tillage, for example, and Kazakh tribes lived alongside them. There is a lot of historical documents which contain numerous negotiations between the Kazakh and Jungarian Khans on cooperation. There are many evidences of the relations of the Kazakhs and the Jungars in the Russian archives. There are whole volumes of such documents. Also in the Chinese archives there is a lot of information. Two powers, both of which sought to conquer the Kazakhs, and they tried to win over our rulers to their side. They offered different titles. For example, the Chinese wanted to make Abulai Khan a van, that is, a vassal Khan. Our rulers, bees and botters in such a difficult situation were looking for a solution how to preserve sovereignty, find a common language with the two powers to get support and help from both of them. The manuscripts also contain a description of the fact that in the 50s of the 18th century, Abulai Khan had a political influence on the formation of his man as the head of the Jungarian Khanate. According to legend, Abulai Khan called one of the contenders for the Jungarian throne his brother. It was Amir Sana. <laughs> Speaking about the relations between the Kazakhs and the Jungars, we need to look more broadly. We should not forget that this was a matter of two great powers, Russia and China, who considered their political interest in this. They wanted to conquer the Kazakhs and set the Kalmyks, the Jungars, the Cossacks, the Bashkors upon us. There is information, not much though, but there were times when the Kazakhs together with the Jungars wanted to oppose Chinese aggression. Of course, they could not unite to create a military alliance with a large army. Individuals made such plans. For example, Amir Sana and Abulai Khan wanted such a union. All this information was found in archives and researched, published as monographic materials. Many do not know about all this, but historians are well aware. However, the plan of Abulai Khan was not realized. The first contender for the throne who showed aggression towards the Kazakhs, Lama Dorji, was killed during the collusion of the Jungar nobility. The power struggle unfolded between Davachi and Amir Sana, but the latter was defeated and fled. Then Abulai Khan decided to independently regulate relations between the two peoples. For this, he and the feudal lords close to him advised the Kazakhs to marry Kalmyk women. Moreover, Abulai Khan himself married a Kalmyk named Toptamish Khanum. The cunning plan of the Kazakh ruler did not stop there. He moved into the country from the banks of the ML River, which is near the border with China, almost 8,000 Kalmyk families. Such a political move soon gave its results. Then a kind of Kazakh reconquest took place when the Kazakhs began to slowly conquer and return their lands. In the book of the Chinese collection of archival documents, the highest approved plans for peace in the Jungars of the 18th century, it is repeatedly mentioned that in 1753-1754, the Kazakhs made military campaigns in Ili and Buratala regions. 
There's also information that the Kazakh Ablai and the comics Dvatma Tseren and Erensen, at the head of the 10,000 strong Kazakh comic troops, attacked Dawachi and looted their opponents in Buratala and other lands. However, already in 1757, Batman Tseren betrayed Abulai Khan and attacked the villages of the Kazakhs, which in return left Abulai Khan no choice but to unite around him all the Kazakhs and repulse the enemy. <laughs> This vast step was left for us as a legacy from our warrior ancestors. Previously, our people had many enemies. They threatened our country from all sides, but the folk warriors were able to resist them. There were a lot of them from all three Jews. Remember their names and honor them. We can highlight Nauris by Batr among them all. Military art, resourcefulness, and fearlessness of Nauris Bai was recognized by Khan Abulai himself when he additionally collected soldiers from the Middle Jews under his banner. He wanted to consult with Nauris Bai Batr, invited his associates such as Rheinbeck and Utigen Batr's. But for some reason, Rheinbeck could not go, and Nauris Bai and Utegen were present at the negotiations. But Utegen Bater did not agree with the policy of Abulai Khan regarding diplomatic relations with China, and he went home. This fact is confirmed in many sources about Nauris Bai and Utegen. Nauris Bai supported Khan and began to help him in everything. Until the end of his days, he was a protector of his people. In general, our Batars traveled all over our country. They fought for every piece of our land. Wherever the evil spirits come from, our heroes went and fought there. The Chinese Empire, Qin, who was afraid of strengthening the authority of Abulai Khan among the Kazakhs and the Jungar, sent an army to Jungaria. The Chinese seized Dawachi and sent messengers to Abulai Khan, demanding to give them Amir Sana, who, after his loss and flight, still managed to make an alliance with the Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Russians, and some Oirat tribes. He gathered an army and began to fight for the independence of Jungaria. Khan Abulai helped him in this in every way. The Chinese understood this and decided to influence their union. In addition, the Jungars were in opposition and in constant battles with the Chinese. And as a result, in 1758, already in the middle of the 18th century, when the Jungar Chinese War lasted almost a hundred years, it was the Chinese side, the Qin Empire, that put an end to the Jungar Khanate. The Manchus and other Jungar tribes were part of the Chinese army. According to the historical Chinese chronicles of the 18th century, Abulai Khan did not fulfill the requirements of the Chinese delegation. Then China launched a war against the Kazakh Khanate in the summer of 1757. The Chinese crossed Tarbagatai and attacked the local Aouds. Abulai repulsed the Qing army, which angered Qin, and China decided to wipe out Jungaria, which at that time had become an actual ally of the Kazakhs. The final of the confrontation was rather sad because we know that the long conflict of Jungar Khanate with the Qin Empire ended in a terrible defeat of the Jungars and their almost complete extermination. But there was also a problem with the smallpox epidemic which killed a significant number of the Jungars. A sufficiently large number of the Jungars fled to the Kazakhs, joined the Kazakhs. Therefore, we are also their descendants. I have already told you about marriages and about Tolingots, and at the very end, some Jungar group also joined the Kazakhs.
Беларуси. Состав казахов такой эпизод был. In 1759, the great nomadic state of the Jungars was destroyed and Abulai Khan went down in history as a ruler who was able to stop the invasion of the Jungars on Kazakh lands. Moreover, during the creation of this episode, I once again realized that history should be studied not only by textbooks. It is important to look into its most sacred depth. My name is Andrei Slozhin. It is the Time Puzzle. See ya.